Welcome back to Laravel Podcast Season 4. Today we are talking to Jonathan Rennick, known for many things, but the primary one today is being the master of eloquent query performance and all that sort of stuff. Stay tuned. All right. Welcome back to the Laravel Podcast Season 4. Today I'm talking with uh, the man, the mystery, the legend, Jonathan Rennick, who's known for so many things I won't even begin to list them off. But the latest incarnation of his reputation comes from being the, the database guy, the eloquent guy in the Laravel community. And Jonathan has been sending out a lot of tweets and recently released a course, which we'll link in the show notes, of course, talking about Um, How to use Eloquent, not just using it, but also thinking about some of the more common challenges that we run into using Eloquent as it comes to optimizing speeds and and what things that do do our Eloquent queries get stuck on and all that sort of stuff. But that's that's not beginner level stuff. Uh, If you are an experienced Laravel developer and have been using Eloquent, I would say definitely check out Jonathan's course, check out his tweets because he's been putting out so much really useful stuff in terms of optimizations. But first, we're just going to talk about Eloquent itself. So before we go there, Jonathan, I gave you a quick intro, but can you just say hi to the people and just let us know who you are and when you meet somebody, how do you actually tell them what you do? Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks for having me on the podcast, Matt. Um, Yeah. So I've been... uh, involved in the Laravel community for quite some time and uh, been involved in open source for quite a while. Uh, kind of early on, I was involved in the PHP league. I uh, had a couple packages that I put out. That was kind of where I got started with uh, mm-hmm. open source. And then I helped uh, Adam Weathen, uh with kind of the initial launch of Tailwind CSS. So that was kind of my, uh, that was kind of like the big project I, I got involved in. And uh, more recently, I've moved to uh, a JavaScript project, which is uh, Inertia JS, which mm-hmm. is um, it's a JavaScript tool that basically lets you quickly build uh, single page applications using React, Vue, and Svelte, but kind of building them more in like the classic server side uh, routing and controller sort of approach that you would with like a classic monolith Laravel application, mm-hmm. meaning you don't need like an API or any of that. So that's kind of like the, the, the other big project that I've been working on recently and then, yeah, kind of over the last few years, I've always had uh, a real strong interest in just databases mm-hmm. um, and and how how databases can affect the performance of your applications and, and kind of the critical role, really, that they play in the performance of our applications. It's not always the most sexy topic. I think <laughs> there's other things that are more interesting that we like to top, talk about. Right. Uh, you know, I, I see a lot more people talking about little silly things like, uh, route caching or or right. other little micro optimization stuff like that yep. that are easy um, but really don't result in significant performance changes to your application. Yeah. Whereas a database is you know the vast majority of applications that we write nowadays interact with some type of database um, and just knowing your database, knowing what's going on between Laravel and the database. And kind of just learning some of the basics can just have such an enormous impact um, on the performance of your application. So that's that's been an area of focus for me, for me. I've spoken at a couple layer cons about it, as you know. And uh, and then, yeah, I launched a course in June all about kind of like an advanced level course called Eloquent Performance Patterns, which kind of really deep dives in all this stuff. So, yeah, it's just something I really I really enjoy talking about. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll notice that I often share crazy uh, database queries type things, and they they tend to be done using all using Eloquent. Yeah, and let's let's that's that perfect so that's a long, intro. Long introduction. No, it's perfect because let's let's so let's talk about a few things. I think the before I think the second thing we'll talk about is what is Eloquent, what's what's Laravel's uh, query builder and all that kind of stuff. But I think the first thing I want to ask is what is it that drew you like. I don't think that a lot of people get into a databases just because they write apps, you know, just because they're building them. So what aspect of your particular experiences do you think drew you into to database pro, uh, performance optimization? Yeah, I, I think, so I always tell people when I first started doing web development, I really didn't understand where the lines started and stopped between each piece of technology. Mm-hmm. So I remember a buddy t- teaching me on my very first application that I built, which was actually a, a project for uh, for um, this uh, a guy I knew who sold wood products. And he wanted a website where he could post these wood products, post pictures, and people could find them and call mm-hmm. them to buy them, right? This, we're talking literally like late, to, late 90s, early 2000s. Okay, yeah. And so I built this app, my very, very first PHP app, very first web project was a PHP 
MySQL application. All right. And uh, and I didn't know really at that time where like which what parts were PHP, which parts were HTML. Right. Uh, there was really like CSS was almost non-existent back then, right? Mm -hmm. And also MySQL. So I just remember just feeling super super empowered, like this this idea that some other user that's totally not technically inclined whatsoever can mm -hmm. go into an administrative control panel that I've created. They can add products and that's going to dynamically update this public website that the rest of the world can see. I just, I just remember being just so like thrilled with just how that whole system works. And so, yeah, fast forward to today, it's really the same thing. I'm still building applications that are driven by a database that, you know, that are out in the web. And, um, and I, I just, I, I, maybe it's just the type of work that I've run into, but I suspect it's the type of work that most of us run into. There always is this database involved mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm kind of just, I, I hate slow apps. I really just hate <laughs> slow. Yeah. So, so you know, like um, anybody who's been in the business long enough, you learn over time what things matter and what things don't really matter. And uh, I guess for me, uh, because I think I started really like quite early on I had to learn some foundational stuff, like some SQL skills that I think maybe mm -hmm. uh, people who are entering into the web development more, say, even today or within the last 10 years, uh, they don't you don't need to know nearly as much, much SQL as you did back then, because we didn't yeah. really have ORMs back then. So I was writing raw SQL. So I had to learn how to do that, Yeah, which was like it was really it was terrible compared to what we have today. Like tools like Eloquent are just they're amazing. Yeah. But I, it did give me a set of skills that I, I, I know now kind of like um, a little closer to the, the metal when it comes to the database stuff. And so as I transitioned from that to using an ORM and using Eloquent, I kind of um, always had this desire to, to do the things that I knew that I could do in raw SQL but do them in Eloquent instead. Yeah. Uh, so for me, that was kind of the transition as opposed to somebody who's maybe learning Eloquent to start and then kind of have to like go back and learn the SQL. Mine went the other way around. And that kind of pushed me to do stuff maybe that it w that the next person wouldn't even try because they don't necessarily know that they even can, if, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And then for anybody who's um, listening to this, who's not familiar with SQL or relational databases, we're going to go in with the assumption that you are. Um, so you might want to hit pause right now and just go watch some five minute primer on those. Um, but the primary um, folks in the Laravel community do tend to use MySQL. Um, but and anything we're talking about here will be 95 percent applicable to Postgres or to Microsoft SQL. Um, but we are going to be talking the context of MySQL today. So knowing, assuming that everybody understands what MySQL is and what SQL is in general, um, can you imagine you were describing to a five year old what Eloquent is and uh, what would it what would it be like to describe it? Yeah, so <laughs> uh, it's been fun listening to the other episodes, seeing yeah. other people struggle through this question. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, so uh, I have put some some thoughts down on this. So, um, getting in my uh, pretending like I'm five years old here. So, um, imagine you're uh, imagine you have a web page which lists all your favorite TV shows. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, shows like Peppa Pig and Paw yeah. Patrol and The Wiggles and all that kind of good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, stuff that you watch in the morning while you're eating your Fruit, fruit Loops. And this uh, this particular web page includes a bunch of extra information about these shows as well. Like maybe where they're playing. Are they on Netflix? Are they on Prime? Are they on cable? And maybe some reviews from other kids who are also watching these TV shows. And, uh, but... Here's the thing, all of this, all this information that's showing up on this TV show website, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not on the website itself, it's up in the cloud somewhere in something known as a database. And a database is really just a big file that contains a whole bunch of information. And you know, for our example, that means that uh, somewhere in the cloud, somewhere in this file, somewhere in this database, it tells us that Sally likes Rubble best on Paw mm -hmm. Patrol. and says that I like, you know, uh, Paw Patrol or the Wiggles the best or whatever, right? And uh, so this is all, all this information is up in the cloud somewhere in this fancy database, but somehow we need to get the information from our database to display in our website. And mm -hmm. that's really where Eloquent comes in. Eloquent is like this magical little tool that sits between your website and your the database up in the cloud that helps you get information out of it and display it on your website. 
And not only that, it can actually also put information into that cloud, into that database as well. So for example, when some kid uh, leaves a glowing review on the latest Peppa Pig episode, that doesn't get saved on the web page. It gets saved up in this cloud in this mm -hmm. database. And Eloquent kind of makes all that happen. It's the glue that, that ties the two pieces together. Wow. I, I felt like I was five and I was getting, my, so I was thinking my daughter is three and my son is seven. My seven-year-old son would have got that no question. My daughter was three, would have been with you until you said the cloud. And then she would have been just looking straight up. So I think a five-year-old probably would have been able to handle that just right. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm very impressed, man. That's nice work. Um, that's great. So one of the things I often do, because sometimes I love that people can simplify it down for a five-year-old, but sometimes that's not enough information for the actual target audience here. So let's imagine that you were talking to somebody who is a JavaScript programmer um, who understands how databases work and maybe has connected to them in, in Node or something like that. Um, how would you describe to them what Eloquent is? What's an ORM and, and what is Eloquent and how is it different and similar to other ORMs and stuff like that? Yeah, right. Okay. So I'd probably start kind of like one ne the next level. I would start by saying that Eloquent is really just a tool that lets you get information from a database and right. display it on your website, or it's a tool that lets you put information into a database from your server side language of choice. Mm -hmm. Getting more into the weeds of what Eloquent is specifically, um, Eloquent is a database ORM that's included with Laravel. So an ORM stands for a I believe it stands for object relational mapping. Yeah. And that basically just means that it maps some data from your database into objects in PHP. Mm -hmm. um, and and these, uh, these ORMs exist in basically um, all, all sort, like all server side languages tend to have these things and, and like JavaScript, Node, uh, PHP, Rails, um, you know, this is a very common thing to have them. And it's just basically a tool that connects your server side language with a database. And actually nowadays it doesn't even only have to be server side. We're now seeing or, uh, ORMs even client side, um, with, you know, tools like Firebase and stuff. So mm -hmm. you can actually go client side straight to a database. Anyway, so um, this is this tool allows you to connect to the database, get data, and update it. But all the while, in at least in Eloquent, uh, you don't do that and you don't interact with your database using some database object, mm -hmm. but rather you do it using models instead. So you don't start by saying, you know, new database and then run an SQL query, uh, mm -hmm. pass it some data to put in or, or whatever. Uh, with Eloquent, Eloquent built uh, using a pattern called active record. And with active record, you basically have models in your application and a model is just a class, a PHP class. Uh, and that model represents a, a table within your database. So okay. real practically, let's just, just imagine you have a database, you know, a relational database, let's call it a MySQL database. And in that database, you have a user's table. So that would mean that in Laravel, Using Eloquent, you would have a model, a user model, so just a, a class in Laravel, a class in PHP called user, mm -hmm. and it would extend Eloquent, basically. So it implements Eloquent, mm -hmm. uh, that model, as like kind of the base class, which kind of enables all this interesting functionality. And then in order to get some data, to, to put some data in the user table or to get some data from the user table, you would actually use that user class to do that instead of, again, using some database classes to do mm -hmm. that. So I'm going to try to walk you through what a simple database query, maybe two simple database queries, what they would look like. Okay. So let's, let's start by saying we want to create a new user in the database. Okay. So what you would do is you would call a uh, user, so the user class. Mm -hmm. And then you would call statically on it the create method. So user colon colon create that method, and then you would pass it array, an array of values, and, and that would and each value has a, a corresponding key. The key, so for example, first underscore uh, uh, first underscore name and maybe mm -hmm. last underscore name, those are called attributes, and those attributes correspond to the columns in the 
in the user's database table. Right. So anyway, so you have this user create method, you're passing in an array, it has these keys for the different column names, and then the values in that array are whatever value you wanna enter into the database table. So for instance, Matt Stouffer, um, and you basically just uh, run that, uh, and it immediately en uh, uh, inserts a row into the user's table. So that's right. like really, really simple, uh, uh, a really simple API that's like, you can kind of read it. It's just like user create and here's the data. Right. It's really, really nice and simple to use. Um, and that was really for me when I f first started looking at active record. Well, I remember like, I remember active record in um, like the code igniter days. That's really kind of where I became most familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew it a little bit from rails, but kind of Laravel is really what made me fall in love with it. Um, it's just this really simple expressive syntax that uh, that's wonderful to work with. That's why I, I think eloquent it's called eloquent because it is just such an eloquent way right. of working with the, with a database. So that's how you would put some data into the database and then, and then getting data is, uh, is equally simple. So again, um, imagine we want to get, so let's say we want to get some data. Let's, you know what, let's start by getting all the user records. So every single record from the user's table, you could literally say, uh, users, so create a variable users and say equals, and then again, call the user model, the user mm -hmm. class, colon, colon, and just say all and call that method. And you now just like that, have every single record, every single row from the entire users table mm -hmm. in this users variable. Typically you don't do that. More likely you're going to have some sort of where condition. So this is where you, it starts getting really interesting. So you can start adding some where conditions and other sort of features of uh, regular SQL queries, and you can append those onto this um, this statement, this user statement. So for instance, you'd maybe say user colon colon, and then say where, and maybe you're looking for your active users. So you give it two values. Uh, the first argument is active, so that's the name of the column that you want to look up. And the second value is the value, or the second argument is the value you want to find. So you want to find all the users with that are active. You'd say true for the second argument, mm -hmm. and then you would append on. So you chain onto that um, a get method call. So this is hopefully this isn't too much to explain over uh, in a podcast. <laughs> but what's the whole the whole um, all of act like all of eloquent is designed to be chained. So when you say user where active equals true, it then, when you run that where uh, method on the user object, it then adds that where condition kind of under the hood and then returns back to you an instance of the query builder, which you can then add more stuff on. So you could say where active is true and then say, or where something else, mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of like build up these complex queries. And then at the end, you just append get as the last method call. Yeah. And then it'll actually execute that query. So when you call user, like kind of said at the beginning, user all, that's kind of like a, like a shortcut for yeah. user get. So um, yeah, it's just a really, really nice expressive way of working with your database. Yeah. Um, and then maybe to kind of just wrap up the, the intro on Eloquent, kind of one, it's not only this really nice, expressive, fluent API, it also has the concept of relationships, which is, I think, the other really big part of Eloquent and the mm -hmm. active record pattern. So within any app, you typically have, you know, each each one of your database tables and each one of these models within your uh, application, they tend not to be islands on their own. They you You often have data that's related to each other. So for example, you might have a user that has many friends, mm -hmm. or you might have a user that belongs to a company, or you might have a product that belongs to many categories. So relationships in Eloquent make it really easy to access related data in a super expressive way. So for instance, um, if I were to get a, if I say I'm working with a user record, um, imagine I'm gonna explain some code here again, so work with me. So in, imagine we have an instance of a user record. Um, what you can do is you could say user and then access the, a property on that user object. 
uh, and we'll say in this case, friends. So you say user uh, dash friends, and now it's gonna, behind the scenes, Eloquent's gonna go off to the database. It's gonna say, okay, we're looking for all the friends for this particular user that we're working with right now. If it has that, the friends loaded already in memory, it's gonna return them back to you right away. But if it doesn't have the friends loaded in memory, it's gonna say, okay, well, we need the friends and we know where to find them. They're off in the friends table and it's gonna go and get those records and then return them back to you. So what it means practically is in your PHP code, in your Laravel code, you're writing this really nice expressive code. You know, you're, you're saying user, you already have a user in memory. You're saying user, give me the friends for this user. Or you're saying, I have a company, give me all the users for this company. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're looking at a product category, go and get me all the products for that category. And it just makes it really, really, really nice to work with your database in this way. Yeah, that was so good. Um, I've got a couple notes going backwards. The most recent one. So notice that all the previous times, for those of you who are learning via audio, all the previous times he was calling things on that user class. So it would be capital U user colon colon whatever, get or all rare. But this most recent one where he's talking about friends, he said it was on an instance. And so just in case you're still kind of growing in your OOP experience, an instance means that's not going to be the friend class or the user class. That's going to be a specific user that has already been returned by a previous one. So that's going to be something like if you were imagine you wanted the friends of a user, what would happen is your first line would be likely something like dollar sign user. So a, a user variable equals something, you know, something that gives you a single user back user colon colon first or something like that. And then on the next line, now that you have a single user represented as an object, then you can call things like arrow friends on it to the friends off of it. And that brings into play a little bit of the, um, what he was talking about earlier about the active record. And, um, I actually just went back and re-listened to the object oriented programming, um, episode with Alina Holligan. If you have not listened to that one, especially if you're new to OOP, I'd recommend again, hit pause and go listen to that one because a lot of things are going to be relevant here to the, to the language we're using. Um, but one of the things we talked about is that you can in Laravel when you're, or in PHP, when you're writing methods or looking at data, you can be calling on an, an individual instance like John Jonathan, or you can be calling it on the class like user. Um, and so when you're calling methods in the class, those are static methods with the two colons. When you're calling on the user itself, you're, you're doing the arrow. And that's helpful both for us to understand where we are at a given, any given moment, but that's also a really helpful aspect of understanding active record. Unlike some other database patterns, so if you've worked with databases before, um, this will, and, and other database record, things that are not active record, this will be really relevant for you to understand it. With active record and therefore with eloquent, the same class describes both the tooling that you use to get data out of your database and save it into your database, so persistence, and that class also represents individual instances of that data. Um, and that's different than Code Igniter, and that's different from, you know, Code Igniter called itself active record, but it wasn't really. But it also is different from a lot of things that don't identify themselves as active record. So just a note a the user class, you call static methods on that to get data. But you can also then get an instance of the user class that represents that object and the user class can delete or modify or save itself. And so it's all kind of really bundled together into one. And that's a very specifically active record thing. And I think that context really kind of fleshes out what it was a really, really great uh, introduction, Jonathan. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, great, great comments. It's, it's, yeah, I've been working. It's sometimes hard to describe this stuff kind of from a beginner's perspective after yeah. you've been working with it for so long. But yeah, that was, uh, that's very helpful. This, that's really where the name active record comes from, right? Cause you're working with this record that you yeah. can now make changes to directly. Yeah. Um, so normally at this point, I'm going to ask you the question about when, when's the last time you used this system, but I think that one's pretty obvious, but I was going to say, I think that there's a little bit further we can dig into there. That is the, um, query builder. So I'm going to ask Jonathan to explain it, but again, there's one more reference back to Alina, the Alina Holligan object during your programming episode. Remember I mentioned that if you do something where every method returns this, you can do this thing called fluent chaining, where it would be something like, um, you know, I think the way I described it was basically you use fluent chaining when the thing that you start with is not complete and you use fluent chaining to modify the thing. So I think at that point we said something like you have an animal and so you'd have like, uh, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah equals new dog. And then on blah, 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 you'd also run set name and then set color and set whatever. And so fluent chaining is the idea that every method you run, like Jonathan mentioned, returns this so you can keep running more methods on it. 
there's some times when that's not a good fit, but it makes the most sense when you're building something. And I love that Jonathan just you just pointed out the idea that we're building a database query. And so when you're doing that DB colon colon or so that that user colon colon whatever, until you hit get or whatever else, you know, delete or whatever, you're just building a query. And so that means you can add a where and you can add a where not and you can add a where in and all these other things that y'all will learn about later. But all these modifiers, what you're doing is bit by bit by bit building up a database query until you actually execute it. So could you, Jonathan, talk to us just a tiny bit about what the database query builder is in Laravel and how it relates to Eloquent? Yeah, that's a that's actually a great question because I think for myself even, I didn't really understand kind of where one piece started and the other piece started before. Yeah. Um, so when you're working with Eloquent, it's important to realize that Eloquent is actually still just a layer on top of what's called the query builder yep. in Laravel. And I'm just going to pull up the documentation because I think even the documentation in Laravel uh, is is organized in this way. So if you look at the docs, you'll see the Eloquent ORM, um, but that actually falls under database. So even the documentation orders organizes these things as two separate things. Yeah. So um, I think that's helpful to r realize because the the query builder is actually the thing that's doing the bulk of the heavy lifting in Laravel. Yeah. And Eloquent, in a way, is kind of just this light layer on top of it yep. that makes it really nice to work with these model these records in in kind of like this um, the active record style way. So if you're the type of person that really doesn't even like active record, there's literally nothing stopping you from even just use, using the query builder directly yeah. in Laravel and not even using the active record functionality. So this is kind of how it works. Basically, when you call, when when going back to say this user example, so when you say user and then you call the where method so because you want to start a new query, what Laravel is doing under the hood is it saying, okay, you called where on the user object. We know that you now want to start making a query. Yep. So what it does is it actually creates an instance of the query builder behind the scenes. And really from that point forward, you're not working with the user model directly anymore. Yep. You're actually working with the query builder from that point on. So this is really, really helpful to know because anything that's possible with the query builder, you can now do that on yeah. that active record uh, model that you're working with. Um, and sometimes it even makes sense um, to just use the query builder directly and not use Eloquent at all. So yeah. one good example of this is if you're doing some sort of like reporting layer, right? Uh, maybe you have a report somewhere in your app that pulls in some data from the user table and then you join in some da data from another table and do some calculations on that and whatever else. What you get back and, you, and basically what you're doing is you're selecting a bunch of custom columns from maybe a couple different database tables. Yep. What you're getting back at that point isn't really a, a user record anymore. It's kind of yeah. like this custom just like record that you've just kind of come up with that makes sense for your particular query. So when you get that record back, it doesn't really make sense to get that back as a user model anymore because yep. what you've created, what you've gotten back from the database isn't really a user record. It's kind of a bunch of this other data. Anyway, so what you can do is in those situations, you can actually just work with the query builder directly. And to do that, you do, instead of putting user colon colon, you do DB colon colon, and then it just runs a raw query uh, I say raw when I mean, when I mean by that, it's just, it's not a, an active record query. And the end result is essentially you're going to get the same kind of database query. Like basically it's going to run the exact same kind of query under the hood because it's all using the query builder, but what you get back gets handled differently. And this is the important piece. Either instance, you're going to get a collection of data back, but the difference is when you're working with active record, you're going to get a collection of user records back. So mm -hmm. uh, Laravel is going to go off when you do say user uh, colon colon all, it's going to get all the user records. It's going to get those data, those records back from the users table. It's going to convert them all into eloquent models. So you mm -hmm. have an instance of every one of those rows as a user model, and then it's going to give them all back to you as a, as a collection. However, when you're working with the query builder directly, 
you're not going to get a collection of user models back. You're just gonna get a plain collection of array values. So you'll get, there will be no models involved at all. Right. And that's often in those situations more desirable because you don't wanna work with an active record because you kind of have this custom report uh, query that you're running. Right. But I think understanding that Eloquent is built on top of the query builder is super useful because it gives you a sense of what you can all do yeah. with Eloquent. And what I'll often do is even if I don't want the returned response back to be a collection of user models or whatever model I'm working with, you can still start mm -hmm. by writing it as a user query. And then before, <clears throat> before you call um, the get method on it to actually get the value, you can call to base, uh, mm -hmm. which is a method on the eloquent. I'm just going to double check that I have that right. Yeah, it's called to base. Uh, and the to ba base method will actually convert it to just a generic plain query builder instance. So sometimes that can even make sense to do that. Um, yeah, I, does that help explain the query builder a little bit better? Yeah, I think that's maybe, great. Maybe, yeah, okay. No, I think that's really good. And I was, it's funny because I, I was thinking it's git query um, but they're not the same. Um, so this is a little no, bit of 201, but important I, difference. Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah. So, um, the important, it's very simple, but it's an important difference. Uh, get query will just give you the raw query, uh, which sometimes is what you want. However, um, to query, I'm just going to verify or uh, to, to base, base, it applies any scopes that you have. Yeah. We should probably talk about scopes before this podcast is over, Yeah. but scopes, um, and that can be really important depending on what you're using. For example, if you use soft deletes, mm -hmm. you need to base. Otherwise, you're going to get deleted records included because uh, uh, soft deletes use scopes under the hood. Yep. Uh, so that's why that's why depending on what you're trying to do, you just got to ask yourself, when I convert this to a base query builder uh, object, do I want Laravel to apply any of the scopes or do I not want to? And that's, that's really... Good. That's really like your global scopes, right? Right. <clears throat> so I think this is a perfect time to talk about scopes. Um, so here's what I think our next good thing is, and then we're going to move on to our normal, what are common challenges and gotchas and any other miscellaneous stuff. But I think that we, in order to define eloquent well, we need to at least cover one other thing here. And I think what it is going to be for me is going to be um, basically, how do I say it? Um, when you're defining an eloquent class, can we talk a little bit about what the various things are going to be on that class? You mentioned relationships. So yeah. in an eloquent class, I can define its relationships. What other things will I be defining on that class? Yeah, great. So um, let me just, yeah. So the big ones are, so we'll start by simple and then we'll kind of move up from there. Um, uh, what is, I'm just looking at some code here as we go. So, so one of the things you can define, uh, right? Like really, really simple. So mm -hmm. by default, Laravel, when you, so I think it's always helpful to kind of use an example. So let's keep working with this user object. Mm -hmm. So by default, when you create a user object, a user model in Laravel, Laravel automatically tries to figure out the table name mm -hmm. that that user object belongs to. And it just uses the class name for this. So if our class name is called user, it pluralizes it mm -hmm. and says, well, we're going to guess that the table name for this is users, yeah, right? Uh, and if you do the same thing with products, and even if you have like stuff that has like underscores and, and it, it does fancy like uh, proper like title case format to like yeah. snake case formatting, it kind of handles all that. However, if you have a situation where Laravel doesn't do the translation from the model class name to the table name properly, you can assign a property on that model or sorry, on that uh, on that class, class. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that says what the table name is. So if you save instead of if you didn't call it table, if, if the table wasn't called users for you, but it was called BFFs forever, <laughs> you could just put that in there instead. Yep. Um, and 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 then from that point on, Laravel is going to use that table definition moving forward. Okay, so yep. that's one thing. Another really neat feature is casting. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll just try to keep this simple again, but imagine you have a table. So you got your users table and in that table, you have a, um, a date. Let's, let's use a date. So maybe it's your birth date. 
So by default, when you go off to the database and get that, that record, that user record back, it's gonna give you the first name, which is a string, and it's gonna give you your last name, which is a string, and your email address, which is a string. Yeah. But then it's also gonna give you a birth date, and your birth date is a string as well, because that's just the way it comes back from the database. So that's kind of right. like some, some deeper under the hood stuff related to how PDO works. But you're gonna get it back as a string in PHP, that's the point. Right. So what you can do in Laravel within your user model, you can define this cast property, which takes an, uh, a key value uh, array where you can say uh, a, a column name. So in this case, birth date. Mm -hmm. So you could say whenever birth date, whenever I pull a new record, a user record from the database, automatically convert the birth date from a string to some date object. So right. you can do that. You can do use the built-in date objects that come in PHP, mm -hmm. uh, which makes it way, way nicer to work with the, the date, right? Because you can then convert it to um, various different formats. Um, you can do operations on it to like figure out, you know, kind of all the stuff related to dates. So it's just, yeah. it's nicer to work with like that object oriented date object as opposed to just working with it as a string. Yeah. And, and Laravel actually uses a really, really fantastic library called Carbon, which is built on top of PHP's date time functionality, which adds yeah. a whole bunch of convenient methods on top of it. Uh, so anyway, so what you can do is you can say uh, birth underscore date, that column automatically casts that to a date time object, which Laravel is going to then convert to a Carbon instance. So that's really, really nice. You can do this for Booleans. Uh, mm -hmm. You can do this for integers. You can do this even for uh, JSON columns. You can have, if you have like a column in your database that's uh, uh, JSON, it'll automatically convert that either to uh, an array, just a plain PHP array, or you, it, can, it can even convert it to a collection. And I think even just like a standard, kind of like a standard object as yeah. well. So that's cast. So that's kind of like the next thing on uh, that kind of comes to mind. <clears throat> Another thing, and then is relationships. So I talked briefly about relationships. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into this because this is kind of like there's a lot to relationships. But no the, kidding. The simple, yeah, so the simple way you implement a relationship. So let's say we have, um, let's call it, so let's do user and company. So imagine you have a, a system where you have a user's table, and but then you also have a company's table. And every single user in that system belongs to one company. Mm -hmm. So maybe in your users table, every single record has a company underscore ID. And that is the ID, the primary key from the company's table. So what you can do is within your user model in Laravel, you can define a relationship. And you do this by creating a method within your eloquent model. So for this, in this instance, you would do that by creating a company method. Mm -hmm. And that company method would have one little line in it. It would say return this belongs to, so this being the, the current model, so right. your user model belongs to, which is the name, it belongs to being one of the types of relationships that Laravel supports. Mm -hmm. And then you pass to the belongs to method whatever it is that it belongs to. And in this case, it's the company. So that simple little, it's it's four simple lines of code that is yeah. like, it's very like standard eloquent sort of stuff to do. That four lines of code, then at, from, from that point on, now connects your user model to your company model. Yep. And then you can do all kinds of interesting things with that. It makes it kind of like what I was talking about earlier. If you have a an instance of a user model, you can say, well, give me the company for it. And you can do other things too, like eager load all the, the company records, which is maybe too advanced for this particular uh, podcast. But it's it's got a uh, a ton of benefits, kind of these relationships. And there's there's a bunch of different types of relationships. So you have belongs to, you have belongs to many. So maybe a user can belong to many companies, not just mm -hmm. one company. You can have the, those. Uh, a company has many users. So it's kind of like the, uh, almost like the inverse of the user to company. A company in this case would have many users that belongs to it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so there's a bunch of relationship types kind of de depending on the, the database design. Um, so that's, that's relationships. And then I think the last big thing to talk about when it comes to eloquent models is scopes. And I think it's kind of like your explanation from earlier is helpful. When you're dealing with eloquent, 
you're dealing with these, these models, so these active records, right? So when you have an instance, that's kind of like, um, yeah, how do I put this? Let, let this, this is when you have a specific instance of an eloquent model, uh, such as a specific user, you have a set of functionality that you can call on it, like update or mm -hmm. delete or whatever, right? And that's on a specific instance. The scopes aren't used when you're working with a specific instance. Mm -hmm. A scope is really used when you're working on just the user model itself before it's actually been turned into an instance. And, um, and this is the scopes really help you build your database queries. So scopes don't add any functionality in and of themselves. What they are is prepackaged chunks of query builder code mm -hmm. that you can put into a scope method within your eloquent model that then you can then reuse throughout your application. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example, cause that's again, probably gonna make this easier to, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to think in my own app, what's a good app? Uh, oh, I have one, I know one. Um, so in my particular, one of the projects that I'm working on, in the user table, there is a column that dictates whether that user is allowed to log into the system or not. And that column, it's just a Boolean that's um, called can underscore login. Mm -hmm. So what I could do is anytime I'm now looking for the users in my system that are able to log in, I could write some query, like uh, some eloquent code that goes along this lines. You could say user, you know, uppercase U, S-E-R, colon, colon, where can log in, that being the column name in the database users table, um, and then pass it the value true, because I only want the users who can log in, and then call get on that. Uh, but the problem is, it's not really a problem per se, but what you're kind of doing now is you're you're really leaking these specifics about how your database itself is designed and the name mm -hmm. of the column. You're leaking this elsewhere in your application, which, you know, to be honest, a lot of times is fine. But the problem is um, you kind of got to remember that. And sometimes it's a little more complicated than just checking it to see if one column is set to true or not. A lot of times it's, it's much more complicated than that. So what you can do is you can create scopes which encapsulate, basically take this little bit of query builder code and puts it into a reusable method. Yeah. So imagine on our, our user model, we could then, like we did, like we create a method just like we did for the relationship. But this time for a scope, you would say public function and you'd give it the, it would, the first part of this, the method name would be called scope. That's kind of like the Laravel standard, which basically just tells the Laravel, hey, if this if this method starts with scope, we know it's a scope. Right. And then you give it whatever you want it to be called. So in this case, you would say public function scope can log in. So the, the method name would be scope can log in. And that scope takes an instance of the query builder as its first argument. And then within that scope, you can basically just write that exact same code that we were just talking about, where can login equals true, yeah. but you write that within the scope. So you say query where login equals true, but it only has that one tiny little piece and nothing else. And then now when you need to find the users in your system who can log in, you no longer need to think about, well, what's the name of that column? And what's the value that I need to, to set to get the right users who can log in? Now you can say user, so uppercase U, user, uh, colon, colon, um, can log in. So that's the, the method you gave, you, mm -hmm. you call on the user model and then get. And so it nicely abstracts it. So you end up with this, like, even like, again, this really beautiful fluent uh, yeah. API where you can just um, do run some more complicated database query but the actual way you interact with that model um, is just this really beautiful, simple API that you define. And I honestly, I use scopes like crazy. Yeah. Um, because one, it just, there's kind of like, there's two benefits really. One is um, you get the, the code reuse, right? So mm -hmm. if I write some query builder code, for example, maybe, you know, to log, can the user log in or something much more, much, much more comp complicated. And there are lots of examples of more complicated things. Like for example, maybe you want to write a scope that orders your username first by their last name and then by their first name. Yep. Well, that's two pieces of query builder code that you could then put into this method. 
Um, so, so that's when you put it into a scope within the user model, you now have the ability anywhere within your application to reuse that query builder logic. So it's just, yep. it's, it really just reduces duplication. Um, and then the second big benefit is it makes your code where you're actually using that scope so much simpler off often and much more expressive. Yeah. So you can, um, I'll often, um, so this is kind of a, an interesting topic all on its own. Some people like to use, um, uh, what do they call Shoot. I'm going to forget the name. Um, shoot. Basically objects in PHP that you use to kind of like facilitate getting data. Uh, what's the pattern? I'm going to forget it. Data now. mapper. Remember it. No, not data mapper. It's where you like create like oh, an ob, repositories. Like a, that's the, the thank yeah. you. Like, yeah, so people like to use a repo. Yeah. And the repository pattern makes sense in certain applications where you have like a repository that says, okay, you know, I'm going to ask the user repository, which is just a class to give me a user, or I'm going to ask the user repository to give me, to create a user or to do all these different things. Right. And I'd argue that with Laravel, the repository pattern is actually an anti-pattern in Laravel mm -hmm. because really eloquent takes care of that for you. Yep. And you don't need the repository pattern to do these things. If you have, if you have a bunch of uh, query builder code in Laravel, don't go and put that into a repository class. I would suggest that Laravel has a wonderful way of doing this already. And that's scopes. Take that yep. reusable bit of code and put it into a scope. And it's just going to make your app then in your controllers, you, you, or, or wherever you're going to run the database query, it just makes this, that, that code a lot more simple because it's, it's just concerned about, um, whatever it needs to do. Like, so I want a user that can log in. It's not concerned about, well, how do we actually define what, you know, if a user can log in, which is, yep. you know, there's a column in the table set to true. Um, so I use scopes super, super aggressively. Yeah. And, um, I, that's something I, I always encourage other, uh, people who are new to Laravel and new to Eloquent definitely embrace this early on because yeah. it's, it's wicked. And what's really cool about scopes is you can actually apply scopes to relationships as well. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you said, imagine you have an instance of a company model and you want to find all the users that belong to that company who are able to log in or who are able, you know, who have some other attribute or something, you can create the scope on the user model that defines if they can log in. Mm -hmm. And now when you load those users for that company, you can append on the query that's gonna do that. You can append, well, only give me the ones that can log in. And Laravel behind the scenes will actually generate the proper database query that says, okay, we got this company, we wanna go off and get the users for them. So it's gonna say, well, give me only the users where the company ID equals, for this user equals the company ID for the instance of the company that we have in memory, mm -hmm. plus also limit the results to only those users that can log in, which is a scope that's defined on our user model. Yeah. Yeah, scopes are powerful. And it's interesting because I think that a lot of us know to use scopes for where, and in your course and in your tweets, you've shown just how much more can be done with them. And obviously not appropriate for this, this podcast, but just know y'all like learning scopes does not just allow you to have shortcuts on your where, although that's super valuable for many reasons. Uh, Jonathan just said, it's also going to prepare you to do a lot more other creative stuff and useful and, and functional stuff. Um, but you know, also don't, you don't downplay the significance of readability and deduplication of code. I mean, you know, like there's so many arguments uh, in our community about what the single responsibility principle means. But the best thing I like about it is if I'm going to change some logic, I'd, I'd prefer not to change it a whole bunch of places around my app. And one of the things that allows you to do that is a scope because the number of times I've had to change logic from a Boolean to a date or, uh, you know, like the published at, you know, is published yeah. changed to published at or whatever. Um, and it, with a scope, you change it in one place. You know, maybe you rename the scope and you change it in a whole bunch of places, but it's a simple text up substitution. Uh, yeah. and so you get these really expressive things like user is VIP can log in, you know, whatever and get, and it's just so much cleaner. And as someone who reads a lot of other people's code, that one of the number one refactors that I suggest to people is I look at a database query and I just say, I don't know what this is doing without the context of your understanding of this database structure. Could you make this a scope 
because now I just have a, it's sort of like extracting a method out of a controller, but instead you're extracting repeated code out of a query builder, you know, pattern. That's exactly it. That's exactly what you're doing. Yeah. And that example that you just mentioned, switching a Boolean to a date time field, yeah. that's a wonderful little like uh, pro tip. Um, I've tweeted about this before. More often than not, if you're thinking about creating a Boolean column in your mm -hmm. database, consider using a date time, ob uh, date time field instead. Yeah. Because it's it will serve the exact same purpose because if it's null, that's false. Yeah. But if it's true, there's a date there and now you have some extra information. So maybe it's like they became the VIP. Yep. Well, it's, are they VIP true, false? Well, now I only know if they're a VIP or not a VIP. Yeah. But if you use a date time column, yep. you can now say, well, actually they became a VIP on you know June 5th, 2020. Yep. Yep. So that's just a really simple little thing that's uh, quite often if it's a Boolean column, uh, using a date is a better choice. I totally agreed. I love that. Um, there are two other things I commonly use on um, on my models. Um, they're not quite as common. Well, one of them is very common, which is guarded and fillable. And then the other one is accessors and mutators. So yeah. I'm I'm just going to give the quick rundown of accessors and mutators so that you don't have to dig it. What I want you to do is be ready to give your official Jonathan Running <laughs> opinion on guarded Love versus it. fillable. So Love accessors it. or mutators are really simply the way for you to modify that every single time you get a single a certain column out of the database, it should be modified by a certain set of PHP code. So that's an accessor. So let's say every single time I want to, um, you can either modify an existing column, like every single time I get first name back, I want to capitalize the first letter or whatever. Or you can also create a new fake column, like a virtual column using an accessor. So let's say you store first name and last name and you want a full name to be accessible. Well, you can create a fake column called full name and the PHP logic and that accessor will define how to join the two. So look those up if you're interested. And then mutator is the same, but the opposite end. If you want logic to be performed on your data for a given column every time you save, um, before it hits the database, that's what a mutator is. And it's the same thing. There's just a consistent syntax, just like with scope, but instead of scope XYZ, it's set XYZ or get XYZ. So go look up, um, accessors and mutators if those particular things are useful for you. But, but, um, Jonathan is right. Those are not nearly as common as the other things he listed, but the thing he's about to tell us is the first thing that people do in every single eloquent model they build most of the time. So Jonathan, yeah. tell us, tell us about guarded and fillable and what, what we should do. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of like the spicy topic because it has to do mm -hmm. ultimately with security. But I feel like I'm in I'm in uh, good company because I know that uh, Taylor himself uses my approach and nice. many others do as well. Yep. So I'll first start by giving a bit of an introduction to kind of the the, the challenge or the security issue, and mm -hmm. then kind of how Laravel solves it, and then kind of how I do it. So um, with um, Eloquent, you can create as we've discussed, you can create records in the database and you can update records in the database and you can delete records, right? But in particular, when you create and update records, you need to pass it an array and that array has a combination of keys and values, right? So first name, Matt, last name, Stouffer, email, mm -hmm. whatever, right? Um, and, and that's great. That's a wonderful way to work. But the problem is if you were to take some data from some form, so imagine you have some form in, on your website that that allows someone to um, update that record. Maybe it's someone's their own, very own profile, okay? Mm -hmm. They're able to update some inference. So they're, they're able to update their first name and their last name and their email and their password or whatever, right? But there's also additional columns on that user's table that define other things like their membership level in this system mm -hmm. or whether they can, um, you know, maybe they're, whether they're a super admin in the system can access everybody else's records. So right. there might be like a, a Boolean flip field uh, for that. Um, so you only want them to be able to update some columns and not other columns. Mm -hmm. So what Laravel provides, so and the risk here is, just to be clear, is if someone submits that form and they submit it down with their first name, first name, last name, and their email address, and then within your controller method, you take the values from the request. So you say, okay, request, get all the values from that form and just automatically just update that particular user's record with all the values that came from that form, first name, yep. last name, and email. That's all fine. You can do that. But the, the, the danger here is what if somebody manipulates the request mm -hmm. and instead of just passing down the first name and the last name and their email address, they also pass down a, an attribute that says 
is super admin and they set mm -hmm. that to true. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have protection and you're just blindly passing all the values from that request, all those attributes and updating that user model, that user can theoretically, someone can hack your system and very, very easily update other attributes on the yeah. record. Um, and, and give themselves access to so I've the, access to things that they shouldn't have. So that's a huge security hole. So by default, the way Laravel protects against this is they have this property on that you can define on every single model that's called fillable. So you define it. So if you're on the user model, you might set your fillable attributes to the first name, the last name column, the email column, maybe the password column, whatever, yep. right? So that... If someone tries to pass down a value from a form that they aren't allowed to update, such as is super admin, the system's just going to like, I don't even know if it does. I don't know if it throws an exception or it just completely ignores it. I just think it, it just ignores even, it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, yeah, that's what I would have expected. It shows you how often I actually use this feature. Yeah, exactly. I, I literally don't, <laughs> I don't use fillable. Um, but that's how it's designed to work. To me, the problem, so that's good on one hand. The problem is I actually believe it leads to more security issues than the mm -hmm. way that I use it. So the issue is um, what happens when you have different types of users in your system? So maybe this user updating their own profile, they can only update first name, last name, and email. Yep. But what happens if now me as a super admin, somewhere else in the application, in some admin control panel, I wanna update their membership status, or I wanna set them to a super admin or something mm -hmm. else, Mm -hmm. I now need to be able to update those those columns. So yep. what's going to happen is the first time you do this, you're building this new fancy admin control panel for yourself to manage your customers or the users in this system. And you're going to submit that form and it's not updating that column for you. And you're not yep. sure why. It's like, oh, right. I'm not allowed to update it because fillable doesn't include that. So what do you do then? That's, you add it to fillable. You know, that's, yep. <laughs> yes, you add it to fillable. And now you've created... A security, a security problem. Security hole. Because yep. now you you basically now made it possible for for because fillable is just this static hard coded value in your user model. It's yep. not something that's dynamically set. So if you need some other user to be able to set it who does have permission to do it, you've now made that change for everyone. And yep. Laravel provides some functionality around this where you could where you can actually choose to leave say is super admin as a non fillable attribute. And then there's some there's uh, some convenience methods that you could then use instead in your your control panel uh, controller that I think it's called force create or mm. uh, force update, which okay. will bypass the fillable settings and allow you to force change those, uh, assuming you have access to that those endpoints. And that that works. Um, to do it that way because you basically say, okay, I'll take control in this one area of the application to make sure I don't do something I shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But the problem is you're now using force, which means you're now introducing anybody, you know, every single column they can update. Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't even want this particular user to be able to update everything on that user's right. table. Maybe you only want them to be able to update one extra column. So you're just constantly fighting this like back and forth, like, okay, you kind of, it kind of just reminds me of that um, Simpsons uh, gif where um, um, Homer's adjusting the blinds and it's just yeah. like up, down, up, down, you know? And, yep. it, and that's what it fillable feels to me. Like, okay, I got to do this. You're always kind of like battling in fillable. So yep. my preferred approach, which, and it, which is the preferred approach for, I think more people in the Laravel community is to just disable fillable entirely. Mm -hmm. And the way you disable fillable entirely is um, by setting, so there's, so fillable, I should, yeah, how do I say this in the most simplest way? So fillable whitelists the columns that you're allowed to update. Mm -hmm. There's an alternative property called guarded, which, um, which, which I guess uh, whitelists the fields that can't, or yeah, which whitelists the fields that can't be edited. So instead of defining which ones can be edited, you define which ones can't be edited mm -hmm. with guarded. However, if you just set guarded to an empty array, just like pr pr uh, uh, protected guarded variable equals empty array. Mm -hmm. Now, anytime you work with that eloquent model, there's going to be no, there's going to be no 
um, fillable protection, no mass yep. assignment. I should have mentioned that this is what this is all called. It's, it's basically mass a assignment protection, uh, yeah. mass assignment. Yeah. Protection. Exactly. So it completely disables mass assignment protection. Yep. Why do I do that? I do that because I would much, perf much rather have control of which columns are updated on a per controller basis as yep. my application requires. So for me, if we go back to the example of the profile, right? If I say, if I, if a user is editing their own profile, I don't want them to, um, ed I only want them to edit three columns, first name, last name, and email, and maybe password, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in that controller method, I won't say current user update to update that record and then pass in request all, give me all the values from the request. What mm -hmm. I actually will do is I'll explicitly say, I want these four attributes from the request. Give me the first name, last name, email and password and only update those. And it's that yep. simple. That's how you protect yourself. Don't use request all. In my opinion, you should never use request all. Never, Agreed. ever, ever. Like yep. just don't ever use it. And yep. if you follow that way, you're essentially doing mass assignment protection, but you're not doing it at the model level. You're doing it at the controller level where you have more control so that you can dictate that in one place in the application, this particular user can update these columns and another place, maybe a super admin can update yep. these other columns. And it just gives you a ton more flexibility and, and you're not going to find yourself doing something super silly, like, you know, adding every single column to your fillable column, yep. uh, to your fillable, uh, property on your user model. Because maybe a junior comes on and doesn't fully understand, you know, yep. kind of what that the implications of that are and, and just adds them in there. So that's what I would say. Never use request all. Always use request only. Request yep. only takes that method, takes an array of columns or attributes from the request and you pass those to your update or your create method. Um, yeah. So a little like um, fun fact. If you use validation, which you should be in your controllers, and you say in your controller, so say you're creating, or let's say you're updating a user, and in your validation, you use um, the validator. So um, you say validate, which is um, the validate uh, facade. Um, but I think mm -hmm. you can do this using this dash uh, validate as well. So you say validate, and you give it a, an array of validation rules. So first name, can't be longer than 25 characters is mm -hmm. required email, you know, it must be an email address, password must be so many characters, whatever you have all your validation rules, mm -hmm. the validation method actually returns back only the data yeah. that you're validating first name, last name. So this is a really nice little shorthand where you can basically just take the response back from the validate method and then just pump that right into your yep. update or create method. And it just really what it does is it saves you from having to repeat those yep. columns a second time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, official good, Jonathan man. Rennick position. Don't use, it. don't, don't use fillable use guarded. What I do is I actually create a base model in all my applications, mm -hmm. uh, that all my other models extend and it sets guarded equals an empty array. Yep. It's funny. I, for, I know it doesn't make any difference, but I have been setting guarded to an array that just has ID in it instead only because I'm like, well, I should be protected anyway because I'm, I'm never going to ask for ID, but in theory, yeah. I don't ever want anybody to accidentally update ID. So, but it doesn't make a difference, but I just do it anyway. Just, it's like this little peace of mind for me, but yeah. And that's how we do things at Titan as well. We don't use fillable. We used to use fillable. We have some old projects that do that we're slowly converting and it's, and it hits all the problems that you described, you know, it's just kind of gets anyway. Yes. Um, one of the other benefits, I, know, I, think, you, and it, okay. I, I think there's been talk of, uh, switching the, the default behavior, but yeah, it's really a security thing. So if you're going to make that change, um, how do you implement a change like that? You know, but right. I think because Laravel is designed that way by default. So when you create a new application, the user model has fillable set. So I think for beginners getting started with Laravel, it's kind of like the default app structure, the de default Laravel install sort of suggests that this is the right way to mm -hmm. do it, yep. which I think is hard to change, but I think is an unfortunate default. Yeah. And I, I would say that like, that would be the first change like you would make listening to this is that every single time you open up a new model that you just generated, delete fillable and add guarded equals empty array. And 
use only in the controllers. What I was going to say is you mentioned the benefit of using only in the controllers or something like that is that you get control. But I also like that you get more visibility. It's it's much more clear which ones are allowed and which ones are not allowed at the moment when you're saving the things versus having to remember where it is elsewhere and where it's defined and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. That is an excellent point because I remember on early projects where I was using that behavior and doing request all, I remember mm -hmm. going to my form view to figure out what columns I was submitting down. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Yep, yep exactly. Um, man, as always, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> let's move, as, as good as this is, let's move <laughs> on to a few common challenges yeah. and gotchas. So when people are first, especially first working with Eloquent and the Laravel Query Builder, what are some things that trip people up often? Yeah, so I think, um, yeah. Huh. I think like, okay, so it depends what your background is, right? So if you're coming right. kind of more from my background where you're used to writing raw queries and there is definitely a set of people out there that, that this is their background, sometimes it can be a little bit like feel limiting and, and feel a little bit like, well, how do I do this in Eloquent? Because when you're just used to writing whatever query you want, that can be something that can trip you up. I've learned that you can pretty much write whatever query you want in Eloquent if you kind of know how to do it. Um, Eloquent well, it has kind of its standard set of functionality, you know, creating stuff, getting stuff, updating stuff, deleting stuff. Um, it also has a whole bunch of raw methods. And these raw methods allow you to write whatever database query you need to. Um, so there's like a, a select raw, there's a where raw, there's an order uh, by raw, there's a bunch of helpful raw functions. So if you're coming from uh, a background where you like, you know, you historically have written a lot of raw queries, I would say um, don't give up too quickly with Eloquent. Like try to write it the proper Eloquent way, mm -hmm. but then recognize that Eloquent does have kind of escape hatches for mm -hmm. the, where there's times that the, the, you know, this whole abstraction, which is an abstraction on top of SQL, doesn't yeah. provide whatever it is that you want. Um, yeah. So that's, that's one thing. <clears throat> the fillable guarded one is another awesome thing we've already talked about that trips people up. So we covered that well. Um, understanding the difference between the query builder and collections and in particular mm, here, mm -hmm. yeah, just understanding in particular. So generally, <clears throat> so I'm just going to walk through this again. As I said earlier, when you run a query, it runs, Laravel is going to run the query, get some users from the database, get some products from the database, database, whatever. And then you run, when you call that, that happens when you call get on it, right? And what mm -hmm. it does is it runs a query and gets those records from the database and then returns them as a collection. Quite So that collection is kind of the end result of the query that you ran. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is a collection has a whole bunch of methods on it that are very similar to methods that you'll find on the query builder. The yep. difference is when you run it on the query builder, they're running the database. When you run them on the collection, they're running PHP. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you're not kind of in tune with it and kind of understand how these things work, sometimes I've seen people get too much data from the database and then they do their work in the collection as a collection object mm -hmm. instead of doing it in the database. So for instance, you could say users get, which will get you all your users. And then you can say where um, can login equals true. And what right. that's going to do is it's actually going to get every single database from your, every single user from the table, the data, uh, the user's table in the database, and then it's going to get them all back in PHP. And then it's going to use the collection to iterate through and get only the ones that can log in. And that's, <clears throat> and that's bad for performance because now you're getting all the users back from the database when in reality, you only want the ones that can log in. So it, I'd suggest that beginners familiarize themselves with what is a query builder method and what is a collection method. And as a rule, um, what's to the right of the get call. Yes. Or yes. The, you know, that is the collection method stuff. And what's to the left the, um, is your query builder stuff. And as much as possible, mm -hmm. move whatever you're doing on the right to the left. You want to yep. do more work in the database and less work in PHP. So, yep. and the, the one area that people get in particular, especially hung up on this is with relationships in Laravel. So I talked earlier about how on the on the user model, you could have a company relationship, right? Yep. Or maybe a better example is on the company model, you'll have a yeah, user's, user's relationship. So what you could have happen is if you call in your, say in, um, just to understand the difference, uh, I'll try not to go too long about this, but you, you call on, say you have an instance of a company and you call users on that 
to get all the users from that company. If you call it as a property, mm -hmm. so just company dash users, you are going to get a collection back because what's happening is Laryl behind the scenes is going to go and lazy load that all the users for that company and mm -hmm. return them back to you as an eloquent or as a, as a collection. Sorry. So how that's, that's kind of like, um, how it works when you just call it as a property. However, you can also call a relationship as a method. Mm -hmm. And when you call it as a method, you get back an instance of the query builder for the users for that company, which yep. gives you all kinds of extra interesting stuff that you can do. For instance, you can limit those companies, just the ones that have, that can log in or whatever else you could even paginate it if that made sense. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think people get kind of like confused sometimes about the difference between the two and they both, ha they both have their, their, their use. Uh, just remember that anytime you want to limit the results of the the relationship or, you know, do some sort of um, operation on it that would um, potentially be faster to do in the database, such as uh, sorting or different things like that. Try to do that as a query builder, which means calling the relationship as a method mm -hmm. and not as a property. Yep. Um, yeah. So uh, I know a lot of people first getting going with Laravel have kind of like, and there's, there's, it was kind of just, it's the nature of the beast a little bit. It's kind of wonderful how Laravel is designed, kind of how you can call a relationship as a property. But yeah. It's kind of a bit of a double edged sword because it's, it's a little bit unclear kind of like what the differences between the two are. There, so and, and then, a, uh, yeah, go okay. ahead. There's a note to add there because there's two reasons why that's less performant. One, which you all are probably thinking about and one, which, until Jonathan mentioned it recently, I was I thought it was the only person in the world thinking about. So I'm, uh, the first one is what you're probably thinking about, which is that when you have more results come back from a database and it has less uh, scopes applied to it, it has to do more work in the memory. The database is slower if you're pulling 10,000 things than if you're pulling 10 things. So just most simply. Um, but the second one is that every time you instantiate an eloquent object, it uses a little bit of memory. And nine times out of, well, 99 times out of 100, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you're newing up a new eloquent model because you only have one or two or 10 or 20 or whatever. But if you're doing work with thousands or tens of thousands of eloquent objects, that memory adds up. And it becomes a big deal. And at that point, you're probably going to want to modify what you're working with in some way, shape or form. If you so, first of all, first of all, just don't bring back 10,000. If you can, if you can avoid it, do what Jonathan's talking about here. Scope them down so that you are not returning 10,000 users when you really just wanted the VIPs at the company. And then so so you would do user arrow or no company arrow users parentheses. And then you can scope it down before you get it. Cool. But let's say you did need 10,000. That's a pretty advanced topic. We're not going to get into it here. Jonathan, is there a like a TLDR or should they just get your, 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 um, your course, if they want to learn more about like the, that, that optimization. Oh man. I, uh, like if you actually need to work with 10,000 records, yeah. I like generally in that case, I would say, <laughs> try to find, do whatever you can to not have to do that. Like yeah. generally when you kind of run into situations where you need to work with that level, that amount of data, you want to switch. So one thing you can do in Laravel is there's this idea of chunking. So you can mm -hmm. actually it, um, if you need 10,000, but if you can go through work with like a thousand at a time, yeah. that's better. Yep. Or depending on what the operation that you're trying to do, you could just take those and f throw them off to a job and let the job go and run. Cause yeah. anytime you're working with 10,000 things, it's going to be a slow page and you're going to probably not want to yep. make the user wait through that task. So it's a great opportunity to use a, a queue, use a job. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. It's, and, yeah. And that was, a. Uh, Memory usage, that was, that was going to be my third thing that has tripped people up because, and I definitely experienced this. I think what happens is as you get more familiar with Laravel and Eloquent and just databases in general, you can run into situations where your page is slow, but when you go and look at the amount of database queries you're running, or you go and look at how fast those queries are running, mm -hmm. it's wicked fast. Yeah. You know? So you might have, I have a page that's running two database queries and they're each taking two milliseconds. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I don't have a database issue here, yeah. but this can be deceiving because reality might be, yeah, you, you're only running you know, a couple database queries and they're running really fast, but the reality is it's bringing, potentially bringing 
thousands and thousands mm-hmm. or potentially even hundreds of thousands of records back from the database that yep. Laravel, like exactly you said, needs to chunk through, needs to convert them to eloquent objects. And then what you're going to do whatever operation you're going to do on them. Um, it's all very slow. So anytime you can push that work to the database level and not mm-hmm. get those records to be begin with, you know, databases are awesome at working yeah. with crap tons of data. This is what they yeah. do. This yeah. is what they're designed for. So if you need to do sorting, if you need to do filtering, if you need to do joins, if you need to do whatever, let the database do that work because they're really, really good at it. Yep. And if, if for some reason you find yourself in a, in, a, in a situation where you can't do that, which I would suggest is probably not as often as you think, you, there are little things that you can do that are going to provide you at least little benefit, benefits. Maybe it's a page everyone knows is slow and you're just trying to get it from 60 seconds down to 20 or something like that. You can do things like uh, you can do the chunking. You can also limit the um, columns that you're selecting. You can also use the query builder so you're getting standard class objects instead of eloquent objects hydrated. Those are all possible. So put them in your tool belt. But I 100% agree with what Jonathan said, which is 90, 99% of the time when you're hitting memory issues, it's a, it's a something that you have should have pushed into the database, not some way you need to tweak how Laravel is loading the, the, the results or something like that. Yeah. All right. So yeah. that was that was your third one. Yeah, I actually lied. I have like three more too. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to go maybe real pick, quick, okay? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I'll go real quick. Okay, so one, measure your database performance. This is like, mm-hmm. this should be the thing I should have started this talk with. You need yeah. to know what your database is doing. You need to know without some sort of measuring, you're flying blind. You don't know how many queries you're running. You don't know mm-hmm. how fast those queries are executing. You don't know how much memory you're using. My mm-hmm. recommendation, get the Laravel debug bar installed, get Laravel yep. telescope installed, start tracking your database queries because unless you track it, you don't know. And the problem is everything looks great in development. You go to production and that's where the issues start. Yep. So use use a, a tool like the debug bar or telescope. Um, the next thing is just doing too much in PHP, which we've already talked about kind of related to the memory issues. What happens is people, I think developers, they, they don't know what they can all do in the database or they don't know mm-hmm. how to do it in the database and they quickly bail and they start doing it in PHP instead. Yep. And this is honestly the cause of so many major performance issues yep. um, because you, you end up you know pulling way more data back because you have to because you need to do the operation in PHP yep. and uh, and it goes really slow. So my recommendation is fight as hard as possible to do it in the database layer. And I've talked about this in other podcasts and stuff before how I like at one point we had just this brutal page in this in this project I was building that was like the number one page. It was the number one thing it did in this application. And we were doing it in PHP and there was just no faster way to do it. Uh, And I challenged myself. I'm going to I said, I'm going to figure out how to do this in, in, in the database. And I gave myself two days to do it and I figured it out and it made a radical difference yeah. And I was able to do stuff in, it was Postgres in this particular case, but no different than MySQL. I was able to do stuff in the database that I never even imagined I could. And, and it was, and it just made a, a massive, massive, like it, it's remarkable what it can do. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So the third one I was going to say is just to make sure like people try to make their database vendor agnostic. So they try to make it work with MySQL and Postgres and SQLite. And I think this is like a really big mistake that people new to the framework think they need to do because Eloquent is designed to be this database agnostic layer on top of all these different database types, right? Mm -hmm. But that's because it's meant to allow you to work with all these database types. It's not saying you have to only work with the Eloquent API. And if you think you only can work with the Eloquent Eloquent API, you're going to miss out on all kinds of amazing features Mm -hmm. that these databases each uniquely provide. Like for instance... Um, Postgres has fantastic geospatial support via their PostGIS extension yep. um, that I use like crazy and it's awesome. And, and MySQL has its own features as well that are unique to it. If you try to write database agnostic code, you can do that. Mm-hmm. But essentially all you've done is you've limited yourself from taking advantage of all these wonderful database features. So yeah. I would say don't strive for that. Let Laravel strive for to, to provide a database agnostic API, because that's its job. But you mm-hmm. and your application commit to a database, can commit to MySQL, commit to Postgres, and take advantages, take advantage of what that database offers. And if you don't, you literally are not allowed to argue which is better because you are not taking advantage of yeah. either of those. They're the features. same for you. They're the same. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly the same. Yep. Uh, so my my recommendation is take advantage of your database, learn how to write write raw queries in Laravel, 
allowing you to take advantage of those unique features. Don't, don't be afraid to color outside of the lines of eloquent. It, it provides methods and helpers to do those kind of things. Yeah. That was good. So, all right. So that's my like common gotchas, I guess. I love it. One, one note to your, um, your performance testing gotcha. Um, one of the things that I've found that's very helpful for me is that I keep my seeds light um, and so I miss a lot of the opportunities for, for performance testing locally because not only me, I'm working on a local machine. So the connections are a little bit faster, but I often have a hundred where the real thing's going to have 10,000. Yep. So just a note to y'all that one thing you might want to do to do a performance test. In addition, of course, to adding those tools, each to add it is, you know, try some, maybe add a super, super size cedar, um, to your testing and maybe don't always do all your work there or maybe do, but, but regardless, consider really, really heavily loading your database, um, locally before you even test it on the production environment. I love it, which is a whole other wonderful topic, which is fixtures and using seeds for your tests, as opposed to using factories in your tests, which yeah, I next episode. Yeah, man, there's all kinds of interesting things there. Cause like in my app that I run, like my main SaaS, I actually have a thousand users that I use in my test suite. Like I, nice. I have, yeah. so it, for exactly that reason. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And the next episode after this is going to, well, not next episode, two or three episodes from here is going to be John Bonacorsi talking about migrations, factories, and no, I think it is right after this migrations, factories, and cedars. So you all, you know, you all will hear it, you know, two weeks after, after this one. So hopefully it'll be a really nice tack onto this. Um, but because we are running so far behind because we're having such a good time, let's move on. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there anything else you think we should have covered today that we didn't get a chance to talk about? Yeah. Um, naturally, because I can kind of go on. <laughs> Any one thing. <laughs> two things. Okay. Two, cool. two things. That's all, all I'm going to have. Left, all right. All right. Um, just one. Don't, I just, you know, I really like thinking just kind of as a beginner and, and kind of, you know, what it might feel like to be a beginner it's, eh, and um, some of the traps that people run into. One, I think people underestimate what you can do with relational databases. And I think mm -hmm. the danger with that um, is they too quickly move to other more complicated solutions because mm -hmm. this is how it goes. This is how it goes on Twitter. This is how it goes on Reddit. This is how it goes on Stack Overflow. Somebody says, Hey, I'm trying to search my users table and the query is slow and it's taking too long. And the, mm -hmm. you know what the answer is going to be. You need to use Elasticsearch. Yep. You need to use Algolia. You need yep. to use a document database. You need to use this and you need to use that. Yep. MySQL, Postgres, these are amazing tools that can do way more than you realize. And they mm -hmm. have, they have, for instance, for instance, wonderful search support built in. Yeah. Not to the level that Algolia, which is completely specialized on or Elasticsearch is completely specialized on. But you might, depending on your particular app, if you're building a search engine or an app that has like high priority on search, yeah, you may need sure. to use Algolia. You may, may need to use Elasticsearch. But if you just have a SaaS app where you want someone to be able to look up a user and have a bit of fuzzy searching going on so it supports a bit of misspells and, and some ranking, mm -hmm. you can do that in MySQL. You can do that in Postgres. You don't need to commit to a whole separate service and have the cost of that service and the management headache and all yeah. that. So don't be afraid to push the limits on what your relational database uh, can do. Uh, I was talking, I was tweeting with uh, Sahil, the founder of Gumroad. I hope, hopefully I said mm -hmm. his name right. And I asked him what he uses for, and Gumroad's massive and they like millions and million of dollars of sales, you know, lots and yeah. lots of users. And I asked him, well, you know, kind of how, how big, well, what, what database are you using and how big is your largest table? Mm -hmm. Well, he's using Gum, Gumroad is using MySQL, surprise, surprise. Nice. They're not using some document database, not using anything yep. fancy, MySQL. And he says his biggest table is easily hundreds of millions, if not billions mm -hmm. of rows long. MySQL. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. MySQL can do this. Don't underestimate yeah. it. Postgres can yeah. do this. Don't underestimate it. So that's just kind of one thing. Don't be so quick to jump to other services um, if you have a relational database set up already. Mm -hmm. All right. And then my, my second and my last like big point I want to make is the key to database performance uh, as far as at least selecting data from your system is indexes and indexes mm -hmm. are these amazing, wonderful, magical things yeah. that are hard to learn. Um, and yeah. the reason they're hard to learn is because 
uh, and this is something I've had a, I, I had to really learn the hard way. I used to think indexes was, okay, I, I'm gonna create some tables in my database, and then I'm gonna just go ahead and I'm gonna sprinkle th some indexes on it. You know, I'm gonna yep. add an index to the first name and the last name maybe because I'm gonna search on that, and then I'm gonna add an index to the ID, which happens because it's a primary key, it happens automatically, and then I'm gonna add the a key, or sorry, a primary, sorry, an index to another thing and another thing, just hoping it's gonna make a difference. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely the wrong way to go about it. Don't <laughs> right. add indexes hoping it's going to magically, magically do something because in mm -hmm. all likelihood it won't. And the problem is indexes are not free. They mm -hmm. cost in two ways. One, an index adds additional space to your database because an index is essentially duplicated data uh, mm -hmm. behind the scenes that your data that your database keeps in a separate spot to make it easy to look it up. So that mm -hmm. that has a, a space cost. Um, and the other cost is every single time you make a manipulation to the database, like an update or a create, it takes a little bit longer to do that create because it has to populate that index yep. as well. So indexes are not free. Don't just randomly create them. The trick to making indexes work is to analyze the most important queries in your application. Go find the queries that are running the slowest and go find the queries that are running the most frequent. These are often mm -hmm. referred to as the queries that are most time consuming because just having one bad query mm -hmm. that's slow isn't necessarily a bad thing if it only runs once in a while for some super user, right. you know, on Wednesdays. Like who cares? Yeah. What yeah. matters is the queries that you you kind of like the main value proposition of your application. Yep. Those mm -hmm. are the queries you want to look at, the ones that run all the time. And 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 maybe even a query there you might think is fast because it's running at 50 milliseconds, but if it's running millions of times a day or even mm -hmm. you know, even just thousands of times a day, uh, you might have, you might want to look at an opportunity to create an index there and get that thing down to one or two milliseconds. Mm -hmm. But my point is, don't add in, don't spring on, sprinkle on indexes hoping it's going to make a difference. Instead, start with the query. Look at mm -hmm. the query and say, how could I make this specific query faster yep. and then work it back? And and the way to do it is it's a bit painful, but it works is copy that query. If you use a tool like the Laravel debug bar, you can copy and paste it right out of the Laravel debug bar. Mm -hmm. Go into a tool like Table Plus and paste yep. it in and run an explain on it. And mm -hmm. to run an explain on any database query, all you literally do is type the word explain before it and then the query. That's and then what it'll do, the yeah, MySQL and Postgres and, and SQLite will all give you a summary of what it did to figure out that query. Now mm -hmm. the tricky part is understanding explain. Like yep. for, for years, <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea what this means. Everyone's telling me to use explain, but I can't, I read it and it doesn't make any sense to me. I've learned that it comes down to basically two columns in the explain, at least in MySQL, it's two columns. My Postgres is formatted a little bit differently, but in MySQL it's, um, oh shoot, I forget what they're even called at the moment. But basically it, there's a column that says what index is being used. So mm -hmm. if you have created an index and you think it's being used, but you don't see it listed there, you have a mm -hmm. problem and you got to figure out why that index is not being used. Or if you don't have an index yet, look at your query and say, where do I think I need an index? Okay, well, I'm, I'm looking against this column. Maybe I'll add a, an index for that column and see if it improves this query. Anyway, so that that is, it's it's a bit of trial and error, at least for me it is, because I'm not, I'm not as well versed in SQL that... I'm not well versed enough in SQL to that I can look at a query and say immediately, there's where I need to add the index. So I just mm -hmm. trial and error. And in my course, I talk a ton about indexes and and how to how to kind of figure those out. And I just kind of show by example a whole bunch. So indexes, and then when you, okay, like this is the best part because when you figure in an index, it's like a magical moment because you see a query that's you know taking 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 2.2 seconds. You see it go down to milliseconds. It's such a rewarding thing. It's amazing. Um, yep. Yeah. So indexes. Learn index. Learn how to you know learn how to index. And it's it's like I said, it's not an easy thing to do. I think the best thing to do is just trial and error. And and, and again, but the key is to work from a query. Don't just sprinkle yeah. on. Yeah. Um, and the, the two columns I believe you're talking about are possible keys and key. Yes. So possible, um, key, possible key go is good because it says you're close to getting the index to work, but it's still not working. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's exactly right. Thank you for yeah, looking that then, up. And then and key actually tells you the one that it's actively using right now. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and there's actually another one right at the very end. It's called Extra. It's the last column in MySQL. I think it's called Extra or Extras. Yep. yep. It'll Extra, also yeah. give some information about um, often um, if a if a, a sort is using, like for example, if you're trying to sort some data, like maybe by the first mm -hmm. name, last name, um, it'll show in that column if it's using file sort, I think it's called, which basically means it's not using an end index. It's using like the file system to do, which is really slow. So keep an eye on that last column as well, because it can be an indication of, of issues too. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever seen anything in extra. So I, I need to, I I'm honest, I, to be honest, I always need, know I need to do this, but explain was kind of terrifying to me until I Google that. And I honestly had forgotten that those were the, the columns. So you have brought me back in to the fold of yeah. remembering you use explain. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So if somebody wanted to learn more about all these things, now the first thing we've already talked about is obviously your course, which is absolutely fantastic. It's going to be linked in the show notes. I bought it for everybody at Titan because I had seen some of the stuff that Jonathan had been working on. I was like, y'all have to do this. All of Jonathan's <laughs> blog posts are really, really, really good. There's quite a few really fantastic ones and all of his tweets as well. But outside of Jonathan's stuff, where would you tell people to go look to learn about Eloquent and, you know, using databases well in Laravel? Yeah. So it's kind of the same ones that I think that a lot of people have said before. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the wonderful thing about the Laravel community. It has two, yeah. two gold mines. One, the Laravel docs. Yep. Laravel docs are incredible. And, and really, like if you just start going through the query builder code and then move on to the Eloquent code, you're going to learn so, so much. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's it, there's no fancy answer here. The docs are awesome. Yeah. You know, yeah. Taylor's spoken about how he's made documentation such a, a critical, important part of Laravel, and uh, and it really, and it really is. It's awesome. And then the second one, you know what I'm going to say, Laracast. Laracast. You know, yep. Laracast, <laughs> um, especially as a beginner, Laracast. Yeah. Jeffrey just does a fantastic job of explaining kind of the, the more fundamental uh, um, concepts. Um, he doesn't necessarily get into some of the more sophisticated stuff, the more complicated stuff. Um, but yeah, like you can check out my blog or my course for that stuff. And I've also like, I've spoken at three Laracons now about it. So mm -hmm. if you want a bit of a, uh, teaser on kind of my take on a bunch of stuff, uh, yeah. look up my, like my Laracon New York talk. Um, yeah. I talk a, a bunch about kind of some crazy patterns that I use. My favorite one being dynamic relationships, which is like this super powerful technique that you can use in yeah. eloquent. Um, so check that out as well. Those would kind of be my go-tos at this point. Okay. Well, I will make sure all this is linked in the show notes. And before uh, in the outro, I will ask you how people can follow you and any plugs you want to make or anything like that. But before yeah. that, the personal fun moment. Okay. So last time we talked, you and I talked quite a bit about learning how to fix stuff around the house and around the yard and stuff like that. And I wanted to ask you, what is the most crazy or memorable or good story or whatever of something that you've had to fix recently where you could share with us the experience? And I don't know if it's something you never thought you'd be able to fix or something where it almost blew up on you or whatever, but do you have any good stories? I didn't prepare you. Take your time to think about it. I'll cut out the silence, but I'm just curious. Oh man. I feel like I have to have something like, yeah. Mm. yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So, um, if anybody has ever lived out in, uh, out in the country, in the rural area, mm -hmm. you'll know that home ownership out in the country is way different than home, home yeah, ownership no <laughs> in town. Cause I, I have had a place in town as well, but now I, uh, my wife and I are fortunate enough to have this little 50 acre farm, uh, mm -hmm. just near the town that we live. And, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, but a farm and country property is like so much it, like I have like a million examples of things that I have to fix. Like when we first yeah. moved here, okay. When we first moved here, this, um, that has this well on the property and that's what was feeding all the water to our house. Right. And, but this well water is terrible. Yeah. And, um, it's like super, super high in iron and sulfur. So it's sulfur. It's yeah. just yeah. disgusting. Yep. And it basically like, we, it was completely destroying all the plumbing in the house. So we've since yeah. like removed all the plumbing and redid it. But the yeah. problem is this well was at like it, kind of the back of the property and um, like had like, like it was just like in this little hut and we had yeah. some crazy, crazy cold winters, you know, mm -hmm. kind of when we first moved here and the water lines kept freezing on us. Yep. So there I would be like 
you know, in the middle of the night out there, like with like a heater trying to heat up oh this gosh. little water hut to try to get it to, to thaw, you know, to, so I can get yeah. water back in the house <laughs> fast forward. So yeah. And like it, it, trying to, you know, you're trying to quickly take a shower and leave the house and yeah. there's no water. Like water is like the most painful thing. So we've since, um, completely like in our basement in the garage or in our garage, we dug out the entire floor five feet down and poured mm -hmm. in a concrete cistern. I don't know if you know what a cistern really? is. Really? Yeah. Yes. So now this is what most people do in the area because in this particular area, everyone's got bad um, water. So uh -huh. we filled, the, we got this wonderful, beautiful cistern built, right? Mm -hmm. So it sits in the garage and it's, you know, I got this constant pressure system that pumps the water into my house, redid yeah. all our plumbing. It was all wonderful. But the, uh, the very first winter after we did this super expensive project and whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sure enough, it gets cold outside and the water in the cistern freezes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so now we don't have water. So, but now, and you try, and how do you fix that? Cause how you got you this heat, yeah. block of ice in there. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, trying to like run heaters in there to get this ice. It's just been all water, man. Like if you live in town and you just have like this wonderful water pipe that comes from the town and you don't think anything of it, you don't have any <laughs> pressure grateful. concerns, nothing. It's just, you are lucky. This is not what yeah. us folks in the country have to deal with. So yeah, ended up, uh, ended up, uh, insulating the whole entire garage. So now the garage yeah. is insulated. Okay. So now it keeps it from freezing. Uh, but that's only like one tiny little example of like oh all kinds gosh. of things. Um, we also live where we live. It's like a super windy location. So mm -hmm. we, when we bought the place, the shingles were all bad. So we put all new shingles on the place, but it's super, super, super windy. And the shingles didn't tie down. So for like the first year and a half, every windstorm, half like, not half of our <laughs> shingles, but we'd have like, all kinds of shingles off the house as well. So we'd uh -huh. be up there and I'd have like this tar and I'm like mashing tar between oh shingles, trying gosh. to keep the shingles down. Man, that's country life. Home ownership, man. Home yeah, ownership, yeah. exactly. Sometimes I think, why am I doing this? But I, it is yeah. it is totally worth it, but- uh, That's awesome. Yeah. I grew up um, just outside of, like uh, there was a farm across the street, farm down the way, but my house was not a farm. And so we did have well water and the sulfur, it just like, it smells like raw eggs, like yes. all the time, like going yes. bad. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I had not, I had not thought about that until you said that. And now I remember it very well. So. Yeah. So my, my brother's actually a plumber and, and iron's actually fairly easy to get rid of because mm -hmm. they, they have ways to pull the iron out, but yeah. the sulfur is the nasty stuff. It's, it's almost impossible to completely remove the sulfur smell from water. Yeah. Do you have a softener at least though? No, because we have the, tr now we have it. Now we literally, we have water right. trucked in. So big, massive trucks yeah. and it all comes soft. So it's a, uh, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to worry about it. Yeah. So need, you, did you build like a, um, like a port outside of the garage and they just put a pipe into it and pipe the water in? Uh, like, yeah. So there's like a little like outside. So this, the cistern outside has like this little like cap, like a, yeah, like a port, little, mm -hmm. like, um, a pipe that the yeah. people who deliver the water can pull the pipe, the lid off of it and, and it pours it right into the house. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, oh, that's work, so cool. Works pretty good. Yeah. Um, I was about to nerd out with you and like seven more things about living in the country. And I'm not going to do that because <laughs> we're already at an hour and a half. So uh, how can people follow you if they want to get more about you? We've talked about it, but now actually what's the Twitter handle? Where else should they go? Yeah. You know, everything. Yeah. So I would say two places, um, really just Twitter and my handle there. This is really where I hang out. Um, as, mm -hmm. as you know, Matt, um, so it's just my last name, Reinink. Mm -hmm. That's R-E-I-N-I-N-K. So Reinink, mm -hmm. you'll find me there. And and then my website. So that's where I blog. Um, mm -hmm. If you go to my website, it's exact. It's my last name again, Reinink, R-E-I-N-I-N-K dot C-A. And yeah, you'll find all my blog posts and stuff there. Love it. This was awesome. I had so much fun. <laughs> um, it's always fun to have to cap yourself. Uh, yeah. But... Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thanks for sharing all this stuff. And again, y'all like he's always sharing new good stuff. So go follow him on Twitter because you're going to you're going to learn a lot more. So thank you so much, Jonathan. My pleasure. All right. See y'all later.